just let people do what they want. That's what the guy said on the news. NBC, I think it was, local station, was reporting on Pope Francis' encyclical on, the, on marriage. And they're doing the on-the-street interview, and they asked this one guy what he thought. And he said, I believe you just let people do what they want. That's kind of a common philosophy our day. That's kind of the answer to any kind of big question. Well, just let people do what they want. That's tempting to follow. I'm not sure that's exactly practical to follow. For example, is just people do what they want? Is that what a preschool teacher says to three students having a meltdown? Has any college president ever said, just let people do what they want on a Friday night before a frat party? Your neighbor's blasting his music at 2 a.m. tonight. Are you going to say, just let people do what they want? Just let people do what they want. It is a flawed strategy for, for people battling addictions, whether it's a, a bottle or an online link. Here's a better idea. Cultivate self-control. That's why self-control is a valuable virtue in living life and dangerous when life is driven by anything else, by, by a culture especially, that's out of control. Such danger of life out of control is not, not new in our day. It's been around for thousands of years. If you look at your message insert, I invite you to take notes on the message insert and use this week's Grow, Pray, Study Guide. Uh, a king named Solomon was king 3,000 years ago in Israel, considered one of the wisest people ever, made this observation about life out of control in Proverbs 25, verse 28. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. One great practice of self-control is prayer. Join me in praying the prayer we used throughout this series. We just sang it a few moments ago, but let's pray this prayer together. Holy Spirit, I pray that this day you will fill me with yourself and cause your fruit to ripen in my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When Paul lists the nine virtues of the fruit of the Spirit, they're all blended together as one, he lists self-control last. He's writing this to Christians, but Greek philosophers would have looked at Paul's list. They would have had no problem with self-control being on the list, but they would have listed it first. They thought it was of prime importance because life with no controls is out of control. And when we underestimate the consequences, we miss the power of God's grace. Without self-control, th things just get dangerous. But what happens when you live with self-control? Think about the life-changing power you have when you learn to say no to your own comfort and convenience and yes to the power of sacrifice and denial to serve others. You realize God made you to make a difference. With self-control, you say no to your preferences and agenda and yes to God's plan and agenda. In living life to, to help others out, to, to transform their lives. Self-control teaches us when conflict comes to say no to our pride. Put a high priority on restoring a relationship to take that first step in, in seeking forgiveness. The result? You restore a relationship. You renew a relationship. Christianity recognizes the value of self-control. So, so does the world. They just simply say, try harder. Work at it. As if the power were within us to live a life of self-control. And to a certain extent it is, but if you're going to live on the level that Paul is speaking, Paul says, I've got a much greater power source for you to draw on. For we discover that life under our own power usually leads us down a dangerous path. We can trip. We can fall. We can fail. And that time, typically, we give up. But Paul says there's a greater power at work. Look, he writes here in Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. The Christian life flows out of grace, not guilt. Grace is not an excuse to do wrong. It's a power to do right. It's the power to be in relationship with God. Five times in the three-chapter book of Titus, Paul refers to self-control, to young men, to older men. 
to women, to leaders, and to everybody. Titus is a church planter on the island of Crete where they believe, just let everyone do what they believe is right. Anything goes. And when anything goes, everything falls apart. Five times, Paul calls for self-control. He uses a Greek word, sophronos. It means a sound and reasonable thinking. Think about why sophronos is important. Self-control keeps my tongue under control. Self-control cures foot and mouth disease moments. Self-control transforms a diet from avoiding temptation zones to a food plan, giving you energy, health, and life. And let me confess, I've already had eight gummy bears this morning when Sherry wasn't looking. <laughs> Self-control manages time to leverage relationships. Relationship with God, time for family, time for friends. Self-control creates the discipline for cheer moments. Time spent with God. Now, for me, those moments happen in the morning. I have a hot cup of dark roast coffee. I open up my Bible, and I pray that God will speak into my life and guide me throughout the day. Self-control overcomes doing what I decide is right to following what God says is right. Such self-control flows from grace, God's amazing grace, his gift to you and me of what it means to be in a relationship with Jesus, that Jesus gives us the power for self-control. And so this morning, we've got three guidelines that Paul shares here from the book of Titus. Here's the first one. Self-control is a response to God's grace. Life out of control, it, it's not new in our day. It's been around since sin's been around. It goes all the way back into Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Out of jealousy, 10 of Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery. They were going to kill him, but they thought that was a bit cruel, so they decide they'll sell him into slavery. He can die by somebody else's hand. Well, it begins to work for Joseph. He starts to work his way up in the family household, but yet even in his oppressed state, Joseph maintains self-control. Look what happens to him in Genesis 39, verses 6 through 10. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked th thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. You thought sexual harassment in the Me Too movement was just a couple years old, didn't you? It's been around for a while. Notice, though, that Joseph's self-control is not kind of rooted in his willpower, or in this case, his won't power, but in his relationship with God. Out of that relationship with God, he finds the power of self-control. That's why the Holy Spirit offers, as part of his fruit of the Spirit blend, self-control. Not world control, not others control, not friend control or situation control, not boss control, self-control. Because the painfully obvious fact is, we cannot control those other things. We cannot control the circumstances of this world. We cannot control what other people will do. We are responsible for Self-control. Think of it like a yard of a house. You're responsible for the lawns, flowers, and weeds inside the, the boundaries of your fence. Sharon wishes this was our yard. I could just put a brown picture up and you would know what our yard looks like. As much as my neighbors might want to change my yard, they're not really allowed to come over and plant things or water things unless they want to pay for them at this point in my life. It's your duty to take care of your yard. It's their duty Take care of their yard. As much as you might like your yard and as much as you might not like their yard, you don't have permission to go over there and change their yard. You discipline your children. You may want to discipline somebody else's children, but I think you get in big trouble with the law if you do it that way. That's why self-control is significant. It's how you respond to a situation. What are you going to do? 
you can choose to respond to your children irritating you with either anger or grace. You cannot control their actions, but you are called to control your own. You can respond to your unjust boss with love or gossip, but you cannot control his or her management style. Want to let go of anxiety and stress and fear? Stop trying to control the world and start trying to control yourself. Now you build such levels, such a muscle of self-control, not through your own effort, but through the grace of Jesus Christ and letting that power flow through you. Paul writes about such grace in Titus 2, verse 12. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. The ability to say no, it's not a natural response. It's a supernatural response. God's grace opens our eyes to see what is right and, and what is wrong in this world. To live by God's standard way up here instead of our standard way down here. When we think we know best, life reveals, grace reveals, what God knows best. God's grace builds self-control through Jesus Christ to show us the better way. God also shows us a mirror that helps us to see where we have blown it in life where life has been out of control, and how Jesus gets it back in control. Here's a second guideline. The battle for self-control, it's first one in the heart and in the mind. It can be said that wars are won from the general's desk, not on the battlefield. There the strategy is laid out. The strategy is executed on the battlefield and adjustments are made throughout the battle. In the same way, self-control is won behind the scenes in a battle that no one sees, in the heart and the mind. Jesus comes into this world to die for our sins, to, to die for our lives out of control, to pay the price for our sins from living life the way we want instead of what God wants. We see Jesus praying to empower his self-control to be under his Father's control. Look what it says here in Matthew 26. This takes place the night before he dies. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow, to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther he, farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. One of my favorite moments in the Passion of the Christ movie is Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's face down on the ground. He's approached by the tempter who says, it's too much for one man to do. And then the person who is playing Satan, all of a sudden you see this serpent, this snake kind of slither out of his robe and go towards Jesus. It almost looks like the snake is about to bite Jesus. And Jesus stands up and just kind of stomps his foot into the ground and takes the serpent out. Now, that didn't really happen in the Garden of Gethsemane that we know, but it is some good imagery. It's from the book of Genesis as well. It's the third chapter of the Bible. This prophecy of what Jesus would do. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Satan's head has indeed been crushed. He's defeated because Christ won the way on Golgotha's cross. Jesus wins the first battle in Gethsemane. And yet, notice that when he prayed for whose will was going to be done? He didn't pray for his will. He prayed for his Father's will. If you'd gone to Jesus and said, hey, would you like to like avoid all this cross stuff? Jesus would have said, yes, I would. But I'm under my Father's control. That's what I'm praying for. Now, such grace power can be working our lives for self-control. Look what Paul says here in Titus 2, verse 12. It teaches us to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. In this present age? Like right now? Yes. Not, not just in the past, not just in Solomon's day, Jesus' day, Paul's day, but our day. For what we experience of sin in the world, you might think he'd write of the glorious life in heaven. But Paul writes about living self-controlled, upright and godly lives right now in this present age. How? You live with grace and forgiveness. You tap into the Holy Spirit's power daily for life right now, not, not just in heaven. Use this week's Grow, Pray, Study Guide to, to get into God's Word, 
to let God's word speak into your life as through the power of the Holy Spirit. You want self-control? You win the battle in prayer. You win the battle on your knees. Or you win battle by spending time in God's presence. Here's a third guideline. Self-control is a process of God's spirit working through you. My favorite prayers is by a soldier in the Civil War uh, who died at uh, Gettysburg. It's entitled, I Ask God For. This is what he prayed. I ask God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I ask for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I ask for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I ask for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need for God. I ask for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything that I hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am, among all people, most richly blessed. If you look at Joseph's life in Genesis 39, well, life does not look richly blessed. He went from the favorite son, had that awesome robe that his father had given him, was the best loved one by his dad. His brothers want to kill him. They eventually sell him into slavery. He starts to move up in the slavery kind of chain of command there, so he's over the master's house. He's accused of sexual harassment. He's tossed into prison. And yet, even there, Joseph finds himself richly blessed. Look at how that happens here in Genesis 39, verses 20 and 21. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. By what, while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. You should circle that phrase. The Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. In a life that felt out of control, from, from favored son to almost murder to sold into slavery to thrown into prison for doing the right thing, Joseph practices self-control. And that's because his character is now empowered by God's grace and favor. He understands that God is with him. Whether you're in a terrible moment of life or a terrific, terrific moment of life or any moment in between, God is with you. That's where the power comes. It's not that God has left us abandoned, but that our God comes and he is present with us. A few years ago, Ring Magazine had an article about prize fighter Marvin Marvelous Hagler, detailing how Hagler would psych himself up for a big fight. He would just punch himself in the face to toughen his face up before, before the battle. Well, one Golden Glove boxer read that in New York City. He goes, I'm going to try that before my next fight. So sure enough, he's getting ready for his next fight. He's, he's in his training room before he gets called out, and he puts his gloves on. He just starts punching himself in his face. He's doing such a great job, he broke his own nose and had to cancel the fight. <laughs> Self-control is not an issue of living merely by my own power. That would be like punching myself in the face and, and breaking my own nose. The self-control that Paul calls us to have it's not by my power, not by your power. It's by the Spirit's power. Now, power can be used in, in two ways. It can be unleashed or harnessed. Think of the energy that's available in 10 gallons of gasoline. It can be released explosively. You just drop a match into that, and it's going to go boom. I would not, do not do that. That is not an encouragement to do that, by the way. Or, this is a much better use, the energy in 10 gallons of gasoline can be harnessed. You pour it into your car, in a controlled burn, it's used to transport you hundreds of miles to a favorite restaurant or to gather with family or to go see a sunset. Now, I will admit, explosions are spectacular. Those are the TV shows I like to watch. But controlled burns, they have lasting effect. They have staying power. And Paul calls us to celebrate with staying power what God is doing now and will do for all eternity through his lasting grace power, when he writes this in Titus 2, 13. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. For the world, self-control is a guts issue. 
Do I have the guts, enough intestinal fortitude? The, the N word now would be, do I have the grit through my own willpower? The Nike slogan, just do it, well, that kind of summarizes the world's advice for self-control. Just, just try harder, just do it. But God's advice for self-control is grace. Jesus did it for you and for me. God's grace in Jesus Christ brings life that's out of control, under control. In writing to Titus, Paul affirms we do not gain Christ through self-control. We gain self-control through Christ. For Paul, self-control is a grace issue. Are you ready to receive that grace of God, to let his grace guide your responses in life? Or do I let sinful desires drive what I will do? When life is out of control, remember that God is in control. Building self-control into my life works best when I live under God's guidance and direction. In his word, God reveals his grace and his story of Jesus and our story of life with God. So today, what's your next step? What's your next step to develop self-control that God gives in your life? Maybe it's you block off time around the table for family or friends to eat together. Maybe it's saying no to some of the morning news and yes to more time in reading God's word. You say no to one area of life so that God empowers a powerful yes in another area of life to follow his agenda for life. You believe that God's grace in Jesus Christ brings life out of control, under control. Let's go to our great God in prayer. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for building self-control in our lives through your grace, not our guts. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for paying the price for our sins. Transform our lives, Holy Spirit, to go beyond living solely for what we want to totally for what God wants in our lives. Where life is out of control, Holy Spirit, bring Jesus to give us control. Make self-control an abundant part of the fruit package you bring to our lives right now. We praise you for being our God of grace and love. We praise you for the blessing of your fruit of self-control will bring to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.